So um, welcome anyma, uh, everyone. It's my great pleasure to welcome Kaushik Bhattacharya to uh, the One World Seminar on Mathematics uh, of Machine Learning this week. Uh, Kaushik is the uh, Howell and Tyson Senior Professor of Mechanics and a Professor of Material Science, as well as the Vice Provost at Caltech. And uh, he has done a lot of work in material science in engineering. And I'm very excited to have him today to talk about new work in the area of machine learning on learning-based multi-scale models of materials. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stefan. Um, it really is a pleasure to be here. Um, and the talk will be more uh, less on mathematics of machine learning rather and a little more on towards the application of this to uh, modeling materials, and in particular, multi-scale modeling. Um, this has been a concern of mine for quite some time. So let me kind of give you a broader, try to put the machine learning aspects in a slightly broader context. And, um, so let me begin with kind of a mechanical engineer's views of materials. And uh, so typically a mechanical engineer is given some material and you're asked to design a device for an application. So you typically build a material model, you characterize the material, you build a material model, and then you use that to design, optimize, et cetera, right? So how do you build this material model? Typically you go do some characterization experiments. You may have some <clears throat> idea of some lower scale behavior. So you may want to put that, uh, build a lower scale model and introduce some information for that, from that to motivate the form of the model that you would use for your material. So you can ask, where does this lower scale model come from? Well, that comes from an, another set of experiments and maybe further sets of lower scale models, right? So you have this really cascade of models that we typically use in materials, looking at different scales, um, both space and time. So, one of, uh, so that's kind of a view by which we build our material models. But how do we develop our materials? Well, you do them by some process. And so again, you have some process models, which you try to optimize some set of properties of the material. And the process models themselves have their own cascades. So typically when you're thinking about designing materials for some application, you have this very complex uh, uh, system that you're kind of dealing with, right? Both with respect to modeling the material itself, but also with respect to using those models to develop the material and the processes. And so this is really generally an extremely expensive step, even with all the model modern computations, but it is a remarkably slow and steady and successful <laughs> from a uh, step, right? I mean, you think about your in the environment that you're living at, and you think about the environment you were living at in a few, uh, 10 years ago, and you see how much the kind of the different materials that you're using. So this is a continual process. This is a very large endeavor, and it's expensive and slow, but remarkably successful. So the kinds of questions that I've been thinking about in recent years is, can I use, I have to do all of these linking of scales, can I use some kind of machine learning to do this efficiently? And that's what I'll talk about. But you can also ask, can I use some of the newer computational architectures uh, like GPUs to speed up the evaluation of the low, lower scale models. Because one of the things you do, you, you will see is I'm repeatedly doing lower scale calculations and trying to get information at the higher scales. So can I speed up those calculations? Okay, there's of course uncertainty at, at every step. So how do I calculate the system level uncertainty 
on the basis of all the uncertainties at all these different steps, right? And so that's, uh, and then you can ask, okay, I have two optimization steps. One, when I'm optimizing the material system based on some kind of uh, composite uh, objective, and then I have a blended objective, and then I have some, uh, I'm doing an optimization when I am designing the material, uh, the, the configuration, so can I optimize these simultaneously? So these are kind of the larger set of questions that I've been interested in. And uh, it's actually quite exciting because there's lots of progress in all of these areas. So today I'll focus on machine learning. And let me acknowledge the people who actually, uh, it's been a group effort. Uh, it's, been, it's been in the last couple of years, we have had a lot of fun uh, with Andrew Stewart, and Anima Anand Kumar and all our students. So much of the work I'll talk today are by Nick Kowachki, who is a graduate student of uh, Andrews. So then there is Birgitta Liu, who is a postdoc with me, and Ning Shi Te, who was a former student of mine. Zhang Yi is a student of Anima, and Kamiya was a former uh, uh, postdoc with Anima currently at Purdue. So, this is a group that has been meeting weekly and we discuss various aspects and it's actually been a remarkable uh, fun collaboration. And I've really been at the receiving end of the collaboration um, as someone who they've tried to carry along the way rather than someone who's led the way. Um, so, okay. So let me tell you a little bit more about machine, uh, about multi-scale modeling of materials. I told you that we have all these different length scale and time scales involved. And really the main intellectual framework of this is really to try to build this up into a series of models. For example, if I were interested in metals that are, as I am today, I might have something which describes the electronic structure. So it's density functional theory then some kind of atomistic model, then some model of the defects, then some model of fine scale structure, model of grains. And then of course, this is the application, right? In this case, it's a uh, object, it's a cylinder hitting a plate. But you break this up into these different cascades, you build models at each scale, and basically at any given time, only two scales talk to each other. So that's, a, that's how we kind of divide the world. So for example, if I'm interested in this, at every computational point or every material point in the large continuum setting, I imagine that there is a bunch of grains. So I prescribe what is the average deformation. That's what I mean by regulate over all these grains. It has a complicated stress distribution. I calc and it might be history dependent and all of that. I calculate that and I use that to get back. I filter it. So I calculate the average so, or filter it to get back the stress, right? So at every given step, we are just you always looking at a pair of scales and the larger scale will regulate, gives the overall deformation and the lower scale gives, does some calculation, you filter the results and prescribe somehow the stress. And the same thing happens at this pair of scales, similar in this pair of scales and so on and so forth. So the, the real advantage of doing this is that you're always looking at a, only one pair of scales and then you're putting the hierarchy together back again. Okay. It's actually a fascinating math question in itself to ask whether this kind of division, this kind of divide and conquer is a reasonable approximation. But uh, that's, uh, I'll leave that for another day, but today we'll just accept this hierarchy and look only at this. So when I'm doing this, and if I'm looking only at this pair of scales, you see two things. One is that you have to, do these large lower scale calculation essentially at every point and every time scale of the largest calculation, right? So you have to do a lot of lower scale calculations. 
but you don't use all the information. You only use a small part of the information. So you're doing this calculation repeatedly, but using only a part of the information. So it's a natural question to ask, can I approximate this in some ways using some machine learning tools? Traditionally, of course, we do that by some kind of modeling, but then the question you can ask is whether we can do that. So let me elaborate on it. And today I'll focus very much on this set of scales. At some point, I'll show a small example at the very bottom, but I'll focus very much on this set of scales. So the two scale setting. So let me, a lot of continuum phenomena we model in materials, we model by using some measure of deformation. So the deformation gradient, you have the deformation. So you have the, uh, the gradient, the deformation, some measure of strain or the distortion in the material. And then you might have some kind of order parameter or descriptor or feature, which we'll call an internal variable and I'll denote it by C, right? I mean, so if I'm thinking about plasticity, if I'm thinking about Martin-Citric transformations, ferroelectrics, liquid crystals, liquid crystal elastomers, whole bunch of phenomena, you kind of describe the state of these phenomena by the deformation, state of the material by deformation gradient and the, some kind of internal variable. Now you describe the behavior of the material by saying there's a stress strain relationship. So if I know the state of the material, I know this state of stress. And there's some evolution law for the internal variable. So there's some evolution law which says um, CT depends on F and C. Uh, C. Right, so there's some. So this is typically an overdamped evolution law, first order evolution law, which we use. Okay, I'm going to do periodic homo uh, some kind of periodic homogenization. So I'm going to assume that my material is periodic, so that there is a. So it, it, it's almost periodic in the sense that there's a slow variable and a fast variable, and it's periodic only in the fast variable if I fix the slow variable. Right, so that's what I've written down here. Okay. Then you have the kind of governing equations. You want that uh, you have to satisfy some kind of mechanical equilibrium or dynamics. So divergence of the stress is some acceleration. You have the evolution of the internal variable, right? That's this. And then you have initial and boundary conditions, right? So that's the problem that we typically face. And of course, what we don't want to do is to solve this with at every fast variable. Uh, solve it in the fast variable. So, we're, so let me try to do some kind of uh, homogenization. So I'll do it formally. So I do my usual uh, formal two-scale expansion uh, in terms of x, x over epsilon in the usual way, plug it in, you go through the handle. So you end up with a, what I call a macroscopic problem where you find that you don't, nothing, uh, you, this problem does not depend on the fast variable. It depends only on the slow variable. So it's done only on the macro scale. So it says you have to satisfy equilibrium at the macro scale and some set of in, uh, initial conditions. But how do I get, so I have to relate the stress to the macro scale deformation. And the way you do that is by saying you have to set for every point and at every instant in the macro scale problem, you have to satisfy, you have to solve an unit cell problem. So you're given F from the macro scale problem. You try to find V and C such that you satisfy this set of equations under the assumption that V is periodic, right? So what happens is the macro scale problem gives you the F and its history. You solve this to find S, you take the average of the stress you put it back here, you get this, and you go and do this. So a couple of points, you have to do this at every macro scale problem, X and T are parameters. Uh, and the other point, which is often not uh, fully appreciated, is that this is history dependent, that I really have to provide you the entire history of the deformation. So when I end up homogenizing, even if, Point-wise, everything depends only on um, 
the time derivatives. Basically, when I do this kind of uh, a homogenization, I end up getting an entire history dependence, right? So that's the point I wanted to make. So let me give you a simple example because that's actually, I find this quite interesting and that's actually very important when you discuss. So let's think of a very simple viscoelasticity. So the stress is, it's in one dimension. U is a scalar function of X and T. Epsilon is U, uh, the derivative of U with respect to X. So the stress depends on epsilon linearly and then the time rate of evolution of epsilon, right? So this is a, as simple as you can get in terms of mechanics, right? So I'm going to assume that there are two, uh, it's a two uh, material composite and I start applying load. What you can show very simply, basically by taking um, Laplace transforms is that the average stress depends not only on the average strain and the average strain rate, but actually on the entire history of the strain. Right? So basically what happens is in the, you average in the Laplace domain. So when you take the inverse uh, Laplace transform, you end up with a kernel. So it's very important in these kinds of problems if to really try to capture the history of these problems. Right. So that's the point. Okay. So again, the picture we have here is the following: you have a macro scale problem which gives you the deformation history, and the micro scale problem gives you back the state of stress. Right. So how do you deal with this problem? So the traditional approach is, of course, to do. Okay. So one approach. Uh, the traditional approach is, of course, to model this micro scale problem by some kind of macroscopic constitutive. But if you want to do multi-scale modeling, one is just brute force, right? I'm going to just, at every point, at every time, I'm going to compute the microscale problem. That's often called concurrent multi-scale. Uh, it's frightfully exp uh, expensive, though there are a couple of examples where we do it. I mean, Carparinello is one, quasi-continuum is one, right? I mean, so, so there are problems where we kind of do this. The other is parameter passing. So you, you do a, some kind of compromise between the traditional constitutive relation and the concurrent multiscale. You postulate that there is some const macroscopic constitutive relation and you parameterize it in some ways and then you use the microscale problem to do parameterization. So a simple example of that is the atomistic force fields, right? You postulate that the, there is a force field which depends on some descriptors, and then you try to discover the descriptors and the dependent on the descript, uh, uh, dis dependence on the descriptors from some quantum mechanical calculations. But it really requires an a priori identification of the features, the descriptors, and often the functional form. And of course, it's very popular now in material science to do this regression step using machine learning. That's very natural. But, okay. So this is very expensive. This is requires some a priori information. And especially when there is history dependence, that's an interesting question whether I can, uh, I can really postulate these things properly. So it's a natural question to ask whether I can replace this microscale model with a some kind of uh, um, uh, machine learned surrogate, right? So that's what I'd like to do is to replace this. So the problem that I'm interested then becomes, I have some kind of PDE system here and I want to represent the solution of the PDE system with some surrogate. So that's, that's what I'm going to talk about. Okay. Uh, and again, this is really the work of Nick Kovacki, Burigede and uh, so and I'll talk a little bit about some work of P and G. Okay. So this is, um, so let me put the kind of multi-scale modeling aside for a second and look at, set it up using a relatively uh, simple problem, right? So I'm trying to solve some kind of equation, elliptic equation like this. So I have some coefficients A, which might depend on X, 
So I have divergence of A grad U equals F, some kind of generalized Poisson equation with, uh, so I think of this as a mapping from this function A, which may be in L infinity to the solution U, right? So the PD is basically the map from the coefficients to the solution. I could also think of it as a map from the forcing F to the solutions, right? But from, let's just think of this in this way, right? So I, what I'm interested in is really trying to approximate the map from some Banach space to another Banach space, right? So that's the problem I have. So first of all, how do I kind of create some typical machine learning approaches are discrete. So now I've from one function to space to another. So that's the question. The second is the data is numerical. So I often will have this data itself in some discrete form. And I don't want my approximation to depend on the discretization. I'd like it to be independent of the discretization. So I really want to approximate the operator and not the particular uh, realization, discretization of that operator. So here's this idea of really Nick and uh, Andrew. So what you do is, okay, so you say, I'm going to try and find a projection operator and a lifting operator. I call it projection, but some kind of reduction operator, P, which will reduce my Banach space to some finite dimensional representation. And then I want a lifting so that I can lift back from this finite dimensional representation to the original state. So basically I want the composition of the, the reduction and the lifting operator to be some approximation of identity. So PCA might be it, autoencoders might be it. So I'll do that not only for my input space, but I also do it for my output space. So now I have a representation <clears throat> of the input space in some finite dimensional setting and an output space in finite dimensional setting. So I can start training a neural net, a deep neural net between these two. And my approximation then is going to be the following. I'm going to compose the projection, the deep neural net and the lifting operator, right? So now I'm mapping from one Banach space to another, which approximates this. Right? And if my projection, uh, if my reduction or projection operator is good and the lifting operator is good, then they should really be a good representation of this function. So what can you prove in this setting? Here's what you can prove. Okay, so this is my machine learning surrogate, right? I mean, this orange line is my surrogate. Okay. So, okay, this is infinite dimensional, this is infinite dimensional. So you should know something about what, what you're sampling, where your data is sampling. Right, that's, some, that's something you need to know. You need to have a sufficiently large dimension to kind of be able to uh, represent the data that you have sampled, right? And if you do that, you can bound the error in your approximation, right? So that's basically what this theorem states. So, okay, so this was done in the Hilbert states, states setting. <clears throat> So you have two uh, Hilbert spaces, X and Y. We're going to assume that my map is actually Lipschitz. And that's a strong assumption. In fact, the, uh, the example I, I gave you, the map from the parameters to the coefficients to the solution is not Lipschitz, but we need this for this. Okay, so we are going to say that this is a, uh, these are uh, projections are by PCA, so my, okay. Then I have a probability measure from which my data is drawn, right? So that's very important that I know probability measure that the data is drawn. So what you can show is that given any epsilon, you have the two dimensions and N which characterizes the neural net such that you can bound the error and the error has two expectations. Of course, you have to, the error is over some sample 
from which your data is drawn. So you have to average over all the samples and you have to average over all possible collections of data from this measure. Right. So, you, so that's the only thing that we know how to model. So what it tells you is that it's important that you ha have a good uh, sampling of the probability measure from which you're drawing your data. And then you might have outliers, but you may only in some average sense find the error in your model, right? Okay, so this is just basically the point. Uh, notice there's something in the chat. Uh, okay, so that's a Stefan's message. Um, I should have said uh, at the beginning, you're welcome to uh, interrupt me at any time. <clears throat> hard enough to give a talk to my screen. So I'd rather be interrupted uh, if there are any questions. <clears throat> um, maybe I'll take this opportunity then sure. to ask. Uh, so here you're, uh, you are taking the expectation over your finite data set. And yes. um, uh, I think that is a standard assumption in machine learning, but obviously here you are in the situation where you want to design something you could so you could in principle generate your data set by choosing which simulations you run or which experiments you perform would that change things uh okay that's a good question i so you're asking whether i okay so that is really a question about what is the measure from which your data is sampled. So what here I'm assuming is that I know the measure over which the data is sampled, which is essentially a statement of I know how I'm performing the experiments or the simulations from which I'm generating the data, right? So, and that's the second part of this. Uh, so the distribution of the data and the distribution from which I'm sampling could in principle be different. Right. Okay, thank uh, you. No, that's not, no, no, no. The data is sampled from, the, from this given uh, distribution. They are the same. Okay, but do you need, I-, I So what I mean by this is the following, right? I, I'm average, so I'm given a finite data set, I'm averaging over it. Mm -hmm but I'm also averaging about all possible finite data sets I could get from this measure. Okay. So of course, yeah. Okay, so that's the two expectations, right? Okay, so here's an example, some numerics, uh, because I wanted to kind of illustrate these two points. Um, okay, we do a simulation over, uh, over some, uh, with some discretization, 421 to 421. Uh, we actually downsampled the data to 128 square. Sorry, I forgot that. And we use that, we downsampled the data to 128 square, and we use that to use our approximations. We have this data at 421 square, but we downsample it at uh, 128 square, and then use that to fit the neural net approximation. We use a PCA dimension of 70 for both of the input and output spaces, some pretty pictures. So this is A of X, this is your ground truth, this is your approximation and your error is small. And this is 10 to the minus, even I can't read it. It's many times smaller than the scale, right? I mean, so this is very small compared to that. So, a little more quantitative. This is what I wanted to say. Can I can I ask one, one question quick? Sure. Um, so uh, in the in the theorem, there's this P one P uh, not PCA. What does yeah. that mean? So I I don't see the relationship to the rest of the theorem. Okay. So what's the role of the PCA again? Can you say that? Uh, because the the role of the PCA is that I'm sampling from some Hilbert space. And I'm constructing a neural net uh, approximation in a finite dimensional space, and that's the role of the PCA. If I were to go back, it's I'm, this is the neural net. I'm so I have to 
I have a map from one Hilbert space to another. I have an so I have a projection error, I have an approximation error, and I have a lifting error. And that is the role of the PCA. Okay, so um, you take your data, you apply PCA, and that gives you your lifting. Or... Right. Okay. That's right. right. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. But, yeah, but okay. then, but, 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 sorry, um, because now you make an assumption, the theorem starts with these PCAs already existing, and then the data comes afterwards. So my interpretation is not correct. And um, the PCA seems to be- No, no, okay. okay. So it's stated maybe what I'm given is that I'm given, I'm given these, I'm given my data, and then I find there exists, I should probably say there exists P, PY, P not PCAs with certain dimensions and that. Gotcha, okay. No, so of course, yeah, That's... you train your PCA based on the data, sorry. All right, yeah. So it's not okay. stated, um, okay, good point, actually, I never realized that, okay. Very good, okay. So here's an, uh, here's a numeric, a uh, little more. So as I said, we, my data is 128, uh, 128 square. I train it, but, and what you're going to see is that this is the error at 128 square is this guy, is at 30, PCA dimension 70, and PCA dimension 150, right? And <clears throat> I'm going to train this with a data set of 100, uh, a thousand realize a thousand simulations. So I fix my uh, data set. I train against that, and I test against another. Uh, so this is the test error. But I generated this data using a 421 calculation. So I can ask, how does it do? If I were to give you the data in a 421 resolution, I can use the PCA reduce it to these dimensions and go back. So you can. See see that the error is relatively uh, invariant against the resolution of the data I have. So the approximation I, I'm doing is really depends on the, uh, is trying to approximate the operator. And this is true as long as the dimension of the data is large compared to the di dimension of the PCM. Okay. All right, um, there's one interesting thing which also tells you so you see that this was a PCA dimension of 30, 70, and 150. So you see that the dependence of the PCA dimension is non-linear, uh, non um, non-monotone. And that's because I'm keeping the data set fixed. If I have a higher, uh, higher PCA dimension, I actually need a larger data set to train, and that has to do with one of these expectations, right? So the point I wanted to make in all of this is really that you need sufficient, you need to know a knowledge of the measure, uh, the distribution from which you're sampling your data. You need sufficient number of data for training, and you need some regularity. Okay, so we don't know what exactly, but we need some. Okay, so I'm going to now give you two examples. Uh, where we are going to apply uh, this idea. And one of them is what is called crystal plasticity. So this is, so I have a piece of metal or ceramic. I have some unit cell in each, this is called a grain. So this is the kind of microstructure at the beginning of my simulation. So within this grain, I have the same crystal, but a different crystal. It's the same crystal in every grain, but the orientation of the crystals are different. So this is, you can think of this as one of the internal variables, this kind of orientation field. So Q of X tells you the orientation, it's piecewise constant to start with, and that is one of the internal variables. There's a whole bunch of other internal variables of uh, the plastic strain and the slip along many activities. The model is a mess. It's a large, hard calculation to do this, right? But the point for now is 
it's really a first order system. So the, the evolution equations are divergence of stress equals zero and some rate of evolution of these internal variables depends on the state of the system. Right? So it's a first order system, just exactly like I showed you earlier. And I solve it, I have some uh, code which solves it and I go forward, right? Okay, so I've, uh, I have a tricky situation uh, that I have to, I'm given a history from zero to some time t and I want the stress at time t. t. That's really not in a, this kind of function space setting. So what I'm going to, but in a typical simulation of this kind, what you do is you're really given the entire history of f of t and you find the entire stress history, right? So you pick some capital T, you do a simulation from zero to T. So you're given your input on some interval zero to T and you're given your output on some interval uh, um, zero to T. So your map that you have from the simulation is from this entire history to this entire history. And if this map is causal, then I can always extract what I need. And of course the physics here is causal. So I expect that the actual map itself is going to be causal. So if my approximation is good enough and it learns causality by really mapping this history to this history, I should be able to get what I need. So now is the sampling part. So how do, how do I sample? So, I, so this is my input, this is my output. So I'm, so I have three components in 2D, three components of strain, three components of stress. So that's my input, that's my output. So the function here is a function of time, function here is a function of time, right? So in the applications I'm interested in, the strain can go up and down, but there's some smoothness. It's not that it's very jittery. So this is the way we do it. We take this interval zero to T, we divided it into n subintervals, and then we pick increases and decreases on these subintervals, and then use some kind of spline smoothing. Right? And we do this in two ways: in which one, in which all the intervals are fixed in, so all the interval subintervals are fixed in time, and one where the subintervals are random. They all add up to the total interval, but individually they're random, right? So that's, well, I'll show you two particular ways. Okay, we write it, um, okay. very good. And we have two versions, let me not worry about of the code, but let me not worry about it. So here's an example, here's two examples. You can see that this is my input and you can see that I've changed my input at fixed intervals, so it's going, this was a point of change, this is a point of change, this is a point of change, right? So I go up and down depending at, uh, at each interval. Here the intervals are fixed. This is the same, this is where the intervals are not fixed. Some intervals are short and other intervals are large, right? So this is, okay. So this is my input and this is my output. I train it with a certain number of training. I test it against a certain number of tra tests. Training is typically 3,200 in 2D and in 3D, we go up to about 30,000. Um, um, okay, so you can see both the results of the simulation, the truth and the approximation, the trained approximation here. So in this particular realization, right? Okay. So this table shows you, uh, okay. So in this case, R, R means I'm going to use the random intervals both for training and testing. The training data is 3,200. The testing data uh, data set was I think about a thousand. Uh, PCA dimension for both the input and the output is 32. And you get a testing error of about 5%, right? You'd have to do some testing and the, uh, uh, training, but the testing error is about 5%. And this is a typical example. So this is not a hand-picked example. This is a typical example of how we do 
So 5% integrated L2 error is actually pretty good uh, in these kinds of settings, right? So if I test uh, train using random and test against random, I get 5%. And the same thing happens if I test against the fixed time intervals. But if I do it the other way, if I train against the fixed time intervals and train, uh, and sorry, if I train against the fixed time intervals and test against random intervals, I do very poorly. Because somehow this is a much richer distribution than this. And so uh, it doesn't capture this. So what we do, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you simulations on the 3D where I'm going to train only on the random and test on. Okay, the resolution depends. Okay, so, yeah. so we also wanted to see whether for the typical kind of mechanical tests people are interested, whether this kind of random training does well. And here are two examples. And you see you do reasonably well, except when your strains and your stresses become very high um, because you're sampling from this distribution. So the extremes are not sampled that well. Here's the statement of causality. As I mentioned, the physics and the data is causal. The architecture we chose was not a causal architecture. It was mapping the whole interval to the whole interval. But we find that the approximation ends up learning causality from the data. So here are a number of uh, tests where the input is identical for all these tests from zero to TB. Then from TB to one, they're different. So you can see that the stress is identical from zero to TB and then they diverge. Here's the other test. So what we're going to do is that everything is identical for up until different points in time and then they diverge. And you can see that all these trajectories follow the same until they start diverging that way. So <clears throat> we feel confident that our data learns causality uh, uh, our train network learned causality simply from this. We also did other tests. Uh, our data was sampled from an isotropic distribution. It learned is isotropy. There are many other things that it learns. And ultimately this only reflects the fact that the approximation is pretty good with the kind of errors we have. Okay. So let me now show you one slide of how we apply it. So what we have is I have my, so what I did was I approximated the unit cell problem. Uh, so I implement that. This is as, a, okay, so this is what, this is a commercial finite element package. I implement the, mat the material model as it's called ViewMat. Uh, this machine learned surrogate as a uh, material model in this, uh, in this finite element uh, package. So I'm doing some macroscopic simulation at each point. It reads the strain history and returns the stress at that point, right? And here's an example of a simulation. I have a, I have a plate, I have a plate and I have a cylinder which is come, uh, traveling at a certain velocity. The cylinder is both rigid and massive. So it just, goes through un unimpeded. And here's a typical, uh, the, here are three results with three different plates uh, thicknesses. And you can see waves bouncing up and about this plasticity here. You can also, if I zoom in here, there would be some uh, differences. So all these three simulations were done with the same trained model, right? Uh, but now I can do a design study once I have trained the model, uh, a single model, well, plate thickness. And in fact, if you read through, you will see that the, the failure modes are actually different in the three different cases. In this case, it is what is called a punching. And in this case, it's dominated by bending. Okay. So you can do other simulations. There's one more, what is called the ta uh, Taylor anvil. Here's a cylinder of this material is hit against a rigid wall. There are three cylinders with three different aspect ratios and you can look at, look at it and see that there are three very different ways the waves propagate, okay. So we could do a lot of design studies 
using a model like this once you have trained it. So, so give you some sense of how effective this is. If for a particular calculation, so let's focus on this particular column. <clears throat> if I used a kind of traditional model, it would take 262 seconds. Whereas if I use this machine learn surrogate, it took me about nine times that effort, right? If I were to do concurrent, it would take me orders of magnitude uh, higher. Right? And the one time offline cost of training it is actually much smaller than doing a single surrogate calculation, right? So you this big, given that the errors are small, I'm really doing the accuracy of a concurrent calculation at a few times the cost of a traditional constituted model. So this is a very effective way of calculating uh, of uh, using this. Right? So that's what I say. It's a very effective way. So a couple of criticisms. One is that I have to keep track of the entire history of the deformation and that's okay for training, but when I'm doing the large scale simulation, I have to keep track of the history. So that puts limitations, that puts strains on the amount of memory that I have. So I have to store it in a memory. So it limits the memory. You can actually be very efficient with it because you remember that you're doing a PCA step. So you only have to keep enough information that your PCA part is fine, right? So uh so you don't have to get every time step but you still have to keep things in memory right uh the second one um so one question actually let me go back to this point one question is do i really need to do all the history is there a way i can use hidden variables or macroscopic uh hidden variables to try and do uh to make this really a uh, model where I don't need the entire history, but only do an incremental time step. And I'll make a comment about that more. Second, in this particular setting, I have to train a material model for every virgin material. It'll be wonderful to, if I were to able to do this, I really look at a virgin material, characterize it by the hidden variables and then move forward. So that, that would be great. Okay. okay. In the example I showed you, the small scale problem did not have any inertia because my density didn't fluctuate. Uh, I kind of filtered out all the high frequency. And if you keep micro inertia, this becomes a much, much harder problem, right? Because now you have to really do some, you, you're asking whether you can sample phase space somehow, whether you can introduce effective temperatures and so on, much harder problem. So let me make a comment about this aspect. And this is really a teaser because we are just beginning to learn it. So you may recall this example I gave you where the stress, state of stress depended not only on the strain and the strain rate, but on the entire time history of the strain. So the question is, can I, okay, if I were to train it, I'll have to do very long intervals. Can I learn something with a uh, with some kind of recurrent network or something which keeps some hidden variables? So we tried an architecture of the following kind. The stress at a given time depends on the strain at that time, the strain at a previous time, and a set of internal variables. And the internal variables at any time depends on exactly the same things. So part of it is cheating because we were inspired by what we typically do in mechanics, right? So this is what we would do in mechanics. The stress would depend on strain, strain rate, and some internal variable, and the internal variable would evolve according to first step. And in fact, you can prove that this, I can rewrite this as a, as a system like that. So it's in some sense, it's cheating. I'm trying an architecture based on what I know is going to be but still, it's a question of whether I can find neural, whether I can still learn these kinds of nets. 
Very good. And the answer is you can, right? Um, so we train it. Uh, I don't remember the details now. We train it uh, with a whole bunch of trajectories. And in this case, you only have one state variable. So n equals one. So it's only two equations. And here's a particular simulation where the training data was taken from zero to five. Okay, you're doing only a time up incremental update. So this interval doesn't mean anything. So this is the training, this is the test. And you see that you do reasonably well. The errors, the training errors are up down to 2% and the test errors are down to 4%, right? Okay. So here's an example in 1D where you can learn this. We have actually, uh, okay. We have also tested against trying to say, okay, what happens if I put five internal variables? And it turns out that you can't improve much beyond this. So the errors, you can bring it down on one internal variable and then adding additional internal variables doesn't seem to matter. And that's consistent with this equation because uh, this is the internal variable. So it shouldn't uh, depend on that. So we have tried some other examples where uh, you seem to need more than one internal variable, but um, seems to, you can drive error down to things of this nature. Okay, in progress, so don't know. Uh, there's an actually interesting underlying PDE question here, right? If I give you any kind of evolutionary causal system, can you approximate that system by a high order first order system? Sorry, high dimensional first order system. So I give you some arbitrary causal system, time uh, evolution law. Can you approximate it by a higher dimensional first order system? That's the kind of underlying uh, math question here. And if you can, this kind of architecture can be very effective. The working assumption in kind of mechanics has been that you can. So, <laughs> so uh, very good. Here's another one on a similar nature. This is really what is called viscoplasticity. The stress depends on strain and some internal variable we call plastic strain. The plastic strain evolves according to some stress. Okay, very good. You try the same kind of architecture. And the question is, does the internal variable learn this plastic strain. And it turns out that it does. You tr train it only against stress strain data and it learns an internal variable, which up to a scaling actually mimics exactly the plastic strain. And this picture includes the scaling. So you see that you learn the internal variable by only looking at the stress strain time histories. So, I'm quite optimistic that somehow that one can actually do this. It's an interesting, uh, but there's an int a really interesting question. Uh, also question of whether you can create architectures which are not dependent on the time discretization and so on and so forth. And these are all kind of, so time continuous approximations. These are all questions of uh, topics of research. So very quickly, I don't know how much time I have. Um, very quickly, I thought, you're muted, Stefan. About five minutes you've got. Okay, very good, perfect. Uh, so I'll give you another example on density functional theory. And I wanted to make a slightly different point here. Uh, so what I talked in the previous example was really using <clears throat> machine learning as a surrogate for a constitutive behavior. I now want to talk a little bit about machine learning as a preconditioner of some form. So, okay, so density functional theory, it's a way of computing. You're given atoms and atomic positions and it tells you something about the electronic structure. I can write it in variational form in this way. So you're, or I can look at the Euler-Lagrange equation, which is how it is more traditionally written. 
you are given some operator and you're asked to find the n lowest eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And it's, it's actually a fixed point iteration because once you find the eigenfunctions, you use that to calculate rho and which again informs this operator. So it's basically a nonlinear problem, but you write it as a fixed point iteration, uh, which is often called self-consistent uh, iterations, right? So um, anyway, to solving this is very expensive. If you have n electrons, you have to calculate n eigenvalues and functions. So it's a problem which is order n cube. There are what are called operator formulations, which uh, uses the observation that here that every time all these quantities come in quadratics, so all that you really need is the operator psi tensor psi summed or something. And, uh, and if you do that, you can exploit certain aspects of it and get it to an order n formulation. Okay. So, for our purposes, let's just think of density functional theory as a map from you're given the atomic positions and the atomic charges. And that spits out a whole bunch of fields called rho, phi, u, s, and all of them together determine E. So the E is the energy. So this is u, this is rho, this whole thing is phi, and s is not included because I didn't do the operator formulation, right? So let's just think of this as a map from atomic positions. Let me also fix the type of atoms. So I only have map from the atomic positions to these fields. And I have good codes to compute it at order n. And that gets me to about a few thousand electrons if you're lucky. A few hundred electrons is more like it. Okay? But I'm interested in large problems. So I'm interested in millions of electrons. And so over the recent years, we have been developing a method where we try to use some structure of the solution to create a discretization, which will allow me to solve the problem. And I won't go into the details. Basically what we do is we write, we introduce as a basis. So we are interested in defects. So there's a lot of complicated features here, but far away it's decaying to things which are periodic. So we use a basis which is piecewise periodic and then one which has uh, one which has variable resolution, very high resolution here, low resolution there. And you can get a very nice sub, uh, sublinear scaling algorithm, which actually scales as root n, but it's still very expensive, right? I mean, these are the kinds of calculations we do. And one of the things we learned is that we, the real expense of these calculations is to try and calculate these pre-computed piecewise periodic, uh, piecewise periodic calculations. So we're doing way large number of piecewise, we are doing a large number of periodic calculations. So you have a unit cell, it distorts a little, you do a periodic calculation, it starts a little, and we don't have a good way of tabulating it. So we said, okay, can we try to use machine learning to do that? So I have a unit cell, I distort it, and I calculate these quantities of interest. And from these quantities of interest, I can calculate the energy, or I can of course also directly train the energy that way. <clears throat> so basically the question I had was, if I give you the distortion, can I, train a surrogate to give me all these different fields and the energy, right? So these are in some uh, Banach spaces. And so I do the same PCA reduction here. And it turns out that it's actually very, very effective. So this is a picture. So this is the ground truth. This is the prediction. These are the errors. And again, the errors are order of magnitude smaller. Okay, but here's something which was quite interesting for us. So one of the things, if you are doing DFT calculations, there's a magic number. It's 0.2 millihartree per atom. You have to get your accuracy to that. So very often when you're doing density functional the uh, theory calculations, you are comparing the difference of energies between two states. So you're 
trying to compute small differences between two large numbers. So you have to get your large numbers to a certain accuracy. And that's a magic number. It's about uh, two milli heart rate, uh, per atom. That's what you'd like to get. So here's the total energy, uh, the machine learned energy versus the actual energy. So what we did here was we directly from the uh, calculation learned the energy and you can see the errors. The average error is this, but the maximum error over all the samples we tested was this number. So we're close to the chemical accuracy, this two milli heart rate, which is good. But then what we did is let's actually look at this one. What we did was we also calculated these fields. So can I use the fields to compute the energy? the machine learned fields to compute the energy. And that's what this shows. And you see that the error comes down dramatically. Then what we did was we took the fields, put it into one of the fixed point iterations and computed the energy and the error goes down very dramatically. And that's of course how we are going to use it in our micro DFT calculation. And this shows you really as a predictor of the field, this has an extremely high uh, high um, accuracy. And I really think of this as even if your absolute error can be large as a preconditioner, it can be an extremely effective way because you take, so in other words, many of these problems are nonlinear. You solve them iteratively. So getting a good guess is half the battle. So this can also be a very effective way of doing uh, this in situations where you have very large accuracy. So that's all I think I had to say. So I'll stop here, put back this picture. Uh, much of the work that I talked about is really the work of Nick Kowachki, Burigede Liu, and Yingxi Te. Nick on the math theory, Burigede on the plasticity, and Yingxi on the DFT. Um, so with that, I'm gonna stop. I'll put up some, okay. So all of, virtually everything I told you is on the archive, so you can look it up there. Uh, so one line of talk uh, work that I did not talk about is with um, Zhong Yi Li, who was a student of, of Anima Anand Kumar, where you're rather than learning the uh, um, learning the operator, what you're trying to do is you're we are playing with other other kind of architectures. Uh, in one case, um, kind of. Uh, so a graph neural net, and in this case, a pure uh, Fourier graph neural net. Um, so learning that different problems work well with different architectures, and it'd be great to have <clears throat> some good mathematical understanding of all of this. <clears throat>